bespoke radio for the masses. Headline edition July 8, 1947. The Army Air Forces has announced that a flying disc has been found and is now in the possession of the Army. If the game is rigged, change the game. Game changer. I occasionally think how quickly our differences worldwide would vanish if we were facing an alien threat from outside this world. This is Fade to Black with your host, Jimmy Church, on the Game Changer Radio Network. All right. Welcome. Fade to Black. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Today is Wednesday, December 14th, 2022. And tonight, our guest is Jason Shurka. And I've called the show, What is Consciousness? Discuss that subject a lot on Fade to Black, trying to get answers. And uh, that's it. What is consciousness? And I try to ask every single guest over, you know, thousands of shows uh, that very question. And tonight we're going to do the deep dive. Jason is the founder of Unified. It's an organization dedicated to educating, connecting, healing humanity to ensure that we reach our collective destiny of unity, peace and harmony on planet Earth. His website's unified.tv, that's unified with a Y, and unified.com are in the comments uh, below, in the description, and throughout social media. It's really that simple, and we'll discuss all of that uh, tonight. But first, I would like to welcome back to Fade to Black, Jason Shirka. There he is. Jason, welcome to Fade to Black. Thank you, Jimmy. Thank you for having me. It's, uh, It's good to see you, my man. You look great. Thank you. I'm doing my best. I've been busy, but everything's going well. You know, the, the, the conscious community, <laughs> that, that's, that's a never ending, right? It's just, it's just so awesome. And it, it's, it's kind of like, uh, you know, peeling an onion uh, when it comes to consciousness. And, and I feel that we're going to jump straight into it. I feel that uh, consciousness and, and consciousness and and science are are on a a, a collision course something that i think the conscious uh, community has been asking for science community has been avoiding it right and uh so it's not necessarily mutual but it's something that can't be avoided and we'll be discussing all of that much more tonight jason but first let's do this what's your definition what is consciousness I'm going to answer the question a little differently. Um, To define something inherently is to limit that thing. If we're speaking about consciousness, it's not something you can define truly because that would be to limit something that's infinite in the first place. With that being said, we can give a definition once we understand that preface. I would say consciousness is... I mean, the infinity of existence, you know, their, their existence is consciousness. Consciousness is existence. We like thinking in terms of beginning and creation, destruction. Those are limited terms in this physical realm, but there's a lot more to this realm. There's a lot more to existence than physicality. As we all know, science has proven that as well. I would say consciousness is the common denominator between all something that was never created that can never be destroyed something that never started, something that will never end. It's, it's, it's the unified field that connects everything, which is conscious because everything has order. There, there's nothing that's actually random. As much as we want to say that in science, the more they dive deeper into existence, the more they, they begin to see, well, wait a second, there is an order that we just didn't see up until now. What I have always found interesting is that we all know, and it doesn't matter if you're a physicist, if you're a school teacher, if you're a cook, right? Or if you're a doofus radio show host, it, 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 it doesn't matter. We all know that we can think, laugh, right? Ponder, cry, uh, communicate, right? Talk. We, 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 we have these ability. We know this, Right. But science just wants to say, ah, it's chemistry. There's nothing to see here. 
And it's like they're in denial. And are they in denial? Is it something that they're scared of because they can't measure it? You know, I, I'm really happy you brought that up. Oh, can I say one thing, Jason? Yeah, I'm going to yeah. interrupt you. Please. Um, so Jason and I, uh, this is a few weeks ago now, we're talking on the phone. I call up Jason. So church, man, you, you getting me on the show? I said, yeah, man, let's let's do this. <laughs> I talk about it. I said consciousness. It's about to, you were so uh, excited, uh, to, to just commit a show on, on consciousness. And, you know, of course I am too. It's the reason why we're doing this show, but, uh, this, this is great. And you're in your element. Uh, this is going to be awesome. Absolutely. This is, this is what I do really, you know, that's, it's, it's what I'm most motivated to do in general, because it's what speaks to me the most. I think it's what we have to start diving into as well. So, to what we were saying with, you know, science and, and scientists and physicists and all them wanting to stick to the physical realm, I think you hit it, the, the nail on the head when it's really whatever we can measure is what makes us feel comfortable because we have a measurement to that. And suddenly when you go into this world that you can't measure, at least with the tools that we have right now, it becomes very uncomfortable because there is no certainty. So there's a lesson in that. And that lesson is where the ego comes in. The ego likes closure. The ego likes knowing things. The ego likes defining things. And by the way, the ego is not all bad. We have it for a reason. Mm -hmm. We have it to, to, to get us through this physical life. It keeps us alive. It tells us when there is danger, run the opposite direction because you're going to die. Because the ego cannot see beyond physical limitations. So it thinks when the body dies, it's done. That's the survival factor that keeps you alive of the ego. Now, the, the wisdom and the knowledge and the knowingness of the soul tells you, well, wait a second, there's something a whole lot bigger than just the body. And by the way, science says it too. It's called the law of conservation. Energy cannot be created or destroyed. So on one hand, you have scientists that understand the foundational law of science is the law of conservation, which is limitless. If it can't be created or destroyed, there could not have been a beginning to creation. There could only be the beginning of a specific form of creation. But or the, period of creation. Exactly. It's like an era, a world, whatever you want to call it. But that energy that that is creating this matter and allowing us to experience life in you know the material has always existed. So it's just a matter of time until the scientists really have no choice but to accept that because they're already saying it and they don't see it. So I want to bring something up from the Scientific American. It was published on October 6th of 2022. And the title in quantum physics was about three individuals, quantum physics scientists, quantum mm -hmm. scientists, that uh, won the Nobel Prize in quantum physics for proving the following. The universe is not locally real. And the physics Nobel Prize winners proved it. Now, what does that mean for a second? Up until now, and th this ties straight into consciousness and how the whole thing works. Up until now, we've been taught, partly because it's really how we experience life, that there are physical objects outside of us. And there are things that exist outside of us. And there is something called space. And there's something called time. And there's a distance that we can travel. And granted, we, we say that because that's how we experience life. You know, today's today, tomorrow's tomorrow. We experience time linearly. We can travel from Costa Rica to Hawaii. That's distance. But what do they mean when they say the universe is not locally real? Local reality is the reality of, call it division. This point, that point, that point. Fundamentally speaking, what they proved, and this article that was published just about two months ago, that's now groundbreaking and changing everything for mainstream science and how we understand reality, it's bringing us to the point of understanding that reality does not exist outside of us. Reality is literally a mechanism of our consciousness. It's light flowing through the mechanism of our consciousness and being portrayed as a projection of light that we experience outside of us. Now, I know that that may sound all weird, so I'm going to break it down and make it simple. When you go to any website on any computer, okay, on a phone, a computer, whatever it is, youtube.com, facebook.com, whatever it is, I encourage anybody to do this right now, even on this YouTube live stream for whoever's watching. Right click on the screen 
And when you right click on that web page, you're going to get a, a window of a few tabs that you can choose from. And one of those tabs are going to say view page source. Mm -hmm. When you click view page source, you're going to have another window that opens that shows you an entire web page of code. You're going to see symbols and characters and numbers and letters and all these things. And if you're doing it now, you'll see exactly what I mean. I'm doing it. So, so this, this is what we call source code. The job of a computer programmer, the job of a web developer is to write that source code and to create a website. That means that the YouTube page that you're on right now, watching this video, seeing all the videos with the likes and the shares and the comments and all that fun stuff doesn't actually exist in that way. It actually exists as a form of source code. So how do we experience it as YouTube.com with a bunch of different you know, videos and space in between the videos and time that we can watch things through? How does that work? That works because the computer that you're using has something called a processor. And the components of your computer's processor, that job of those components is to take that source code, decode it, and then project that light onto your computer screen and give you the experience that you're experiencing now. What that really means is that a website like youtube.com does not exist in the way that we think it exists. It exists as a form of source code. The reason why I share that is because that is how reality works. We have processors physically and spiritually. On the physical side, we have eyes, we have ears, we have noses, we have nerve endings. What's the job of all those processors and instruments of our physical bodies? It's to take formless light, source code, which is infinite in and of itself, and to decode that and thus project that outside of us to experience reality. And in that way, without the perceiver, there is no possible way to experience reality in the first place. In other words, you need awareness and consciousness to be able to be aware of something in the first place, which is how reality is projected and created. And the last thing I'll say is, Jimmy, you have eyes and I have eyes. It looks like we have the same instruments, but you may be able to look at a person and see an aura around them. You may be able to look at a person and see a disease of, a, of, a, of a, an energetic flow that's being blocked in their body. And I may not be able to do that, but we have the same eyes. So what's the difference? The difference is you have a processor that may be more advanced, that may be in many cases more pure, spiritually speaking, physically speaking. And thus, the way that you actually process that light differs from the way that I process that light, almost like if you have a computer processor that can show you videos in 3D versus a computer processor that just show you videos on a flat screen of 2D. It's the processor that makes the difference, which is why we experience reality in the first place. And in that way, consciousness is reality. Consciousness is existence. And our mechanism of consciousness, which is what I explained through that analogy, is how we experience everything outside of us, which is really just a projection of what's going on within. Is there, um, and I, I, I hear it, it's, it's sort of a cop-out. Uh, let me, let me uh, start sure. with that. Um, but scientists will say, in a way, it makes sense. And I tend to agree with it. But there's a fundamental problem here. And here's, here's the question. Scientists will say, well, consciousness it, 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 it exists in every particle, a little bit. So when you amass a bunch of particles, the consciousness accumulates. And so all the particles in our brain uh, collectively lump this consciousness together, and boom, we are able to access it. Well, okay, kind of makes sense, and you can see that, you know, consciousness being everywhere. But here's the problem. Are they suggesting that this pen is conscious, right? Clearly, I can't communicate with it. Or does this pen have feelings? And is consciousness in everything that there is? Okay. So it's a two-part. I'm going to try and answer it in two parts. Number one, and then if I forget, remind me of what you said about the pen. Because I, have <laughs> I can do that. I can do that. Let's go to the beginning for a second. You cannot split up something that is singular. 
and one in and of itself. You don't have pieces of consciousness. If you go to the holographic side of the universe, you don't have pieces of a hologram. Each piece or particle of the hologram is the whole hologram. That's how consciousness works. So you can't have a piece here and a piece there. Consciousness does not come from your brain. Consciousness uses the, the physical tool, the vessel of your brain to travel as a conduit through to do what it does. And that's the purpose of the brain. So it doesn't originate from the brain. It moves through the brain. And, and that's, that's that mechanism of consciousness as well. So that's number one of, of what I wanted to say, where it's not consciousness that could be split up. You cannot split up something that is the only thing that exists in and of itself. Mm -hmm. And if you, if you go to the holographic universe and, and just how holograms work, which is what we're experiencing here, because it's all light. Every piece of a hologram is the hologram. I'm repeating that on purpose because it's very important. And that's also a way that I, I teach. I like repeating. So it, it goes into the, the individual. That's number one. Number two, you said, well, can I communicate with the pen? And here's something really interesting. First of all, we got to define communication. Is it communication with words? That's not what I'm talking about. My answer to what you said would be yes, only in a different way, because there's different forms of communication. I'll give you an example. Let's say, and there are there is proof of this in terms of, you know, on video and, and it's been shown. It's unknown, but it's something that's been shown scientifically as well, where people can move objects without touching them. How, that's called telekinesis. How are individuals moving an object if they're not touching them? And if we understand that there's a unified field of consciousness that connects the energy that creates this matter to the energy that creates my body, to the energy behind my power of thought, then on the physical plane, it looks like you're moving a bottle without touching it. But on, on the plane that matters, which is the unified field that everything is connected to, you're really touching this bottle only in a different way than we know. Again, if this is connected to the same unified field of consciousness that my hand is and that my power of thought is, then if we're taught how to do that, and I don't know how to do this, so this is, this is not something that I can show you how to do. Let's be, let's be you know, straightforward with that. But it's been done with other people that can show you that they can do that. So we have to ask ourselves, how is that possible? And the answer that I've come to thus far is, well, it's not that they're not touching the bottle. They are touching the bottle, only in a different plane, in a different, different dimension, in a different way that we just don't know how to do quite yet on the collective level. So I, I, I'm, I, I'm going to I, I don't do this all night, but this is this is pretty right. cool. I'm going to post a comment and this is from Jessica. She okay. says, I communicated with my car all the time. That is an excellent point in that if you if, in, in my opinion, if you want proof of something like this, that consciousness is is everywhere and exist in particles, uh bitch at your car one day <laughs> right and see if it starts the next morning when you need when you're late for work right and uh, be kind to your car <laughs> you know yeah. and, and it, it may start when when you really need it to start jimmy there's uh there's something that i think is perfect to bring up right now regarding stones I'm bringing it up on my computer as we speak. So you've probably heard this before. If I, if I told you here, this is a, this is a stone. This is called lapis lazuli. Mm, mm, mm. One of my favorite stones. Hold on. Okay. Uh, uh, uh. Bam. <laughs> That's beautiful. That's beautiful. So, so going to stones, especially with, with ancient history that we're starting to, to, you know, further develop our understanding of, if I told you that this stone or this rose quartz can hold memory and we could store memory on it, well, how, how can a stone hold memory? How can a stone, you know, have information on it? That, that doesn't sound like it makes sense. And yet our modern day technology is built in that very way. 100%. Your, your memory, in many cases, even on our phones, is, is used and stored 
using quartz stones, using quartz crystals. So that is all the proof that we need to understand that there is some sort of something going on. If a stone can hold memory, there's some field that we just don't quite yet understand. Now, when we say conscious, does that mean the stone can you know go to the bathroom? No, that's not what we're talking about. Consciousness, and this goes back to the first question that you that you asked in the beginning of this conversation with how do you define consciousness? That's why we can't define it because it's so wide and includes all that if I were to say consciousness is something that can reproduce, can replicate, can speak, you know, can eat. Well, let's go back in time for a second. And this is not so, uh, you know, accepted mainstream, but I would go as far to say, and I I'm curious to hear your thoughts on this as well. You go back in the day to places like ancient Egypt, the reason why they were so advanced, the reason why they were able to connect and move stones in the way that they were and connect to minerals and crystals in the way that they did was because they were connecting to the same unified field that all is connected to. And there have been many individuals speaking about, go to, I mean, extraterrestrial crafts, how they work. And how they work is through connecting the craft, what we experience as just physical dead matter, which there's no such thing as dead matter. There, there's matter, energy, different type of consciousness to that energy. In many ways, that's how the crafts move, by connecting the operator, the individual operator's consciousness to the craft and allowing the craft to become an extension, not artificial intelligence, but allowing the craft to become an extension of the operator's consciousness to be able to move at speeds that are unprecedented. So the only way that something like that can be done, and again, what I'm saying right now could be controversial, you know, in the mainstream world for sure. But I think some people over here may connect to that where the only reason why they, they're able to do that and why that's able to be done in the first place is because there is a unified field that all matter is connected to. And the common denominator of all matter is energy. Now, the degree of consciousness, the attributes of that consciousness how it works, that's all up for you know debate because I don't know those answers. But to say that anything is dead or disconnected from anything else is simply impossible because we don't live in a world of disconnection. Everything is connected energetically. Yeah, it, it, you know, just the matter that makes you up, the matter that makes me up, it's 13 and a half billion years old. And that's a that's a great, you know, that that it just exists and that's what it is it doesn't die when they say that we're stardust well that, that that's a that's a literal statement that is not uh something that's made up by the way your lapis looks better than my lapis uh, <laughs> is that is that lapis i've never seen it in that color before yeah yeah, yeah. It's beautiful though is, isn't it though it's a beautiful it's like, this is uh, out of all of my skulls it's a medium-sized skull right this thing weighs like 10 pounds. Wow. It, uh, lapis, it's so dense. You know, it's such a, uh, I have skulls this size that are half of the weight, you know, a third of the weight. Um, uh, so if, if, if that is the case and this is, this is a way to look at it. And Brian Green talking about, you know, things lasting forever. Um, I was talking to Dr. Gary Nolan the other night, and we'll, I'm going to address Egypt uh, right now. Sure. But um, and in the last third, last fourth of Brian Greene's latest book, uh, you know, the physicist Brian Greene, he talks about he's 120, 200 trillion years in the future, right? And he's describing what's going to be around it. The answer is, you know, not much uh, at that point. But... <laughs> Um, what he does say is that what will survive is thought. So you unpack that statement for a second, right? Now, he's a physicist. He's not going to say consciousness, right? Can't do that. He's going to offend his, his core fan base, right? Uh, can't do that. Can't go there. But thought, and he talks about, you know, these clouds of energy, floating around uh, the universe, still thinking, mm -hmm. right? Still thinking. Now, um, 
that's a hundred and you know two hundred trillion years in the future. I think he's trying to say consciousness without using the c word, right? And that that consciousness is indeed forever. Yeah. Um, and when we get into uh, some of the uh, the laws in in physics. And, and certainly entropy, you know, comes into play and second law. You get into the that where does the energy come from for thought to continue to exist? That's another question altogether. But he isn't talking about individual particles anymore because particles are broken apart. So if consciousness is not in these little particles, but they are amassed clouds of thought that are still thinking, then consciousness does last forever, doesn't it? Yeah, but even even with that, you can't have a particle. Again, depends on how you define consciousness. But if consciousness is existence in and of itself, then anything that exists would be a part of that, and nothing would be separate from that. Well, no, and that's what I'm saying. He he, at that point, he does separate the two, where he's saying that thought is just energy. Right. And he, he now doesn't have the connectedness of uh, particles and consciousness. Uh, no, particles are broken apart. They don't exist anymore. Gravity is, is you know, has ceased to exist. Um, but it's just an interesting way for him to kind of lob a softball out there. <laughs> Planting a seed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Planting that seed. Uh, about consciousness. Now, I'll say this. When it comes to stuff like this um, and Egypt and what did they know, I um, I can't wait to hear your comment on this. I'll, I'll make this very brief. Sure. I don't wanna, it, it's too long of, a, uh, of an experience. But I'm on the island of Philae at the Temple of Isis, which is in the middle of the Nile River down near Kamambo. 500 miles south of, of Cairo in, in the Nile River. And so, I, and I have this crazy thing that is happening to me there. I'm walking around. I'm with a you know group of people, Billy Carson and, and stuff. And I'm leading this tour, but I broke away from, from the group because I'm kind of tripping out. I go and I sit on this giant red granite block on the top of a cliff. Nile River's in front of me. Mm -hmm. And uh, I get a cool uh, bottle of water. I'm dangling my feet off of this cliff. I'm looking at it. Beautiful, right? It's gorgeous. And then it happens. It goes right up my butt, up my spine. I felt it, too, man. It was, it was like, what the? You know, anyway, and, and boom. Right, right out of my forehead. And I'm sitting there by myself. I don't know what's going on. I don't have, you know, some shaman with me, some spiritual advisor yeah. by myself. And and I close my eyes, I go through this, and I hang on to the edge of the cliff, by the way. Right. I don't wanna I don't wanna lose it and fall. But and I open my eyes and I was in a different place. I mean, I'm in the same place. I don't want to say that. You know, I wasn't on Mars, but I'm saying I looked different, right? The colors, the things, the thing, and it was like this crazy. Oh, I get it. Well, I thought I did, but I feel that Jason. It came from the rock I was sitting on. I, I, I really, you know, and it's been sitting there for you know thousands of years, accumulating, right? How many other people sat on this? How many other things flowed into this? How many, you know what I mean? And it it just launched out of me. And that's not a coincidence. It, it happened, I think, because of the stone, the red granite. 100%. You know, I wrote a book and I brought that up as an example, as a theoretical example, where take take the pyramids, for example. No matter how long they've been around, everybody has their own, you know, different timeline based on who you're speaking to. But forget about that for a second. 4,000, 12,000, 100,000, doesn't matter. You have a stone that's sitting somewhere for, you know, tens of thousands of years. There is literal data, consciousness, whatever you want to call it, in that with information that can be extracted 
if you know how to connect to that stone. Now to you, it sounds like it happened spontaneously. Imagine you now learn the mechanism of whatever happened that, that same second, and you can do that on demand. We would no longer have to, you know, have these debates of what actually happened 4,000 years ago or what actually happened 12,000 years ago because the truth of what so many archaeologists nowadays are debating exists in that stone because that stone was there. And once we elevate ourselves enough to be able to connect to matter in a deeper way and understand the information, especially ancient matter like that and ancient stones like that with the information that's imbued within something like that, there will be no more arguments anymore because the truth is there. We just don't know how to extract it yet. But I do believe the day will come. And I believe that clarity will, will be had, you know, across civilizations on this planet as a whole. And uh, and staying on this track, uh, uh, when it comes to some of the theoretical physicists out there, phys quantum, what, what, whatever category or specialty they are in, yeah. most will say, not all, okay, not all, but most will say, I can't waste my time with something that I can't measure or touch, right? And and I've I've got other stuff that is more important. Is that what is stopping the the research? You know, when we define hard sciences, that's the hard science. It's the science that you can touch and measure and 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 quantify. Um, is is that the reason why? Because there's no measurement and there's no way to touch and feel it and come up with a result. Well, there is. We ju we just don't know how to do it yet because we're we're not at that level. We haven't become mature enough. If I if I told if I started talking to you about radio waves 500 years ago you'd probably give me the same answer as a scientist and say we can't measure that so we're out but today you can you know mm -hmm. because we've matured enough we've developed enough as a society and as a civilization as humankind here on planet earth and and probably beyond but speaking on this planet over here we've matured and advanced ourselves enough where we got to understand and remember that the tools that we have and the laws of physics that we think we know are not the ultimate laws. They are a reflection of where we're at and our level of awareness today. So what we know is possible today was impossible 50 years ago. There are things changing all the time because we're changing all the time. And as we expand and as we ascend and as we evolve spiritually, the tools that we begin to use will differ. The way that we begin to read things will differ. So there will come a point where what we're calling immeasurable will become measurable. But again, the, the, the hardship over here is how do you measure something that's infinite? And because I'm not there yet, and because we're not there yet as a species, I really can't answer that question. What I am confident in saying is we will, I don't know what that looks like yet because we're not there. If I knew what that looks like, we, we'd probably be in a different place, especially me at a young age without as many as much experience as everybody else in this world, you know, that that has experience doing this for decades and decades and decades. So I do believe that that time will come where we'll be able to to measure that. Maybe it's not measuring to limit it. Maybe it's just understanding infi infinity in a different way. You know, I don't know what it's going to look like, but I do believe as we advance spiritually those answers from those scientists will change because we just have no choice. I mean, that that's where we're headed. You know, we're, we're starting to discover and we're starting to now research non-Hertzian frequencies. Non-Hertzian frequencies means frequencies outside of the Hertz spectrum. That means frequencies beyond the speed of light. Up until recently and even today, there will be scientists that tell you, you cannot surpass the speed of light. But there is science out there and there is proof and evidence out there showing you scalar waves, scalar frequencies, non-Hertzian frequencies. That, and that goes, by the way, to the universe's not locally real Scientific American article with the Nobel Prize winners and what, the, what they showed, you know, evidently is happening over here, where there's something that moves faster than the speed of light. And it's so fast that it's not moving. It's momentary. It's spontaneous. It's happening everywhere all the time, simultaneously at the same time. The, the speed of now. This the speed of thought, maybe if you want to, if you want to go even further, you know, but 
one one thing that again we can bring proof here that baffles scientists and they don't know what to do with it is quantum entanglement. Quantum entanglement is something that nobody has yet to really understand, but it, it's this thing, and it's not a theory. It's been shown. It's been proven. You know, physically speaking, you take two subatomic particles. You put one on one side of the planet and the other on another side of the planet. And somehow the speed of light is 186,000 miles per hour. Uh, uh, I'm sorry. Per miles, second. Per second, miles per second. So somehow, based on the calculations of the speed of light, there would have to be some sort of lag time between what happens when you do one thing to one subatomic particle and how that's reflected in the other one. And yet it happens instantaneously with not a fraction of a fraction of a fraction of a millisecond, even with their technology. And they don't understand how it's happening. The, the question is, how can something be instantaneous if we're working according to the limitations of the speed of light? There needs to be some sort of fractional lag between here and there. And there isn't. And that's why the universe is not locally real. There's something that pervades all that connects all, that happens simultaneously, instantaneously, at the same time. And that's what we have to start researching. Well, it, it, entanglement um, is, a, you know, I, I love Einstein's comment, right? Spooky action at a distance. Yeah. And, and, and he was right, because entanglement is uh, something that is so science fiction the Chinese have absolutely, you know, uh, you know, proven uh, this theory and this idea uh, that entanglement does exist, and they've done it great distances with satellites, and uh, which is which, you know, so it's the rotation of a particle, right? And they go out and they ch you observe it. Oh, uh, we're going to get to observation in a second, which is something else altogether. But um, boom. And these uh, interactions are now. They're not, like you said, uh, with a little bit of lag. But when uh, consciousness doesn't want to be discussed in, in physics, but yet they want us to uh, digest how a quantum computer works. <laughs> and, and, and and it's 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 it, wait a minute here you can't have one without the other can you jason you can't have a qubit you can't have entanglement you can't have these kinds of things going on and then not uh not attempt to understand what consciousness is because they seem to be uh very connected and maybe the same thing for that exact reason it is inevitable to get to that point. How long it's gonna take is a whole different story. I think it's gonna happen a whole lot quicker than we think. But this is where science needs to go. Science is finally beginning to very apparently merge with spirituality and consciousness is that next step that if it's not researched, we're just not gonna continue moving. So it, it becomes inevitable to, to move through that. But I mean, that. We're living in exciting times, Jimmy. We really are. We're, we're, we're in a time period where we're going to see a massive turning point. We've already started seeing a massive turning point. And not only this great awakening around the world for people to understand their own power within, but also science is shifting. It's becoming less limited. It's becoming more infinite. And it's starting to go into things like quantum computers. You know, what does that mean? How do you do that if they don't understand or even acknowledge quantum mm -hmm. entanglement? They will have no choice. The um, the idea, I mean, I could I can pull it up right now. Well, let me get off of my uh, view page source. Uh, <laughs> it, it is uh, you, if you look up observation and you listen to any number of physicists. By the way, this is you know physics one hundred and one, man. This is your introductory. Uh, uh, semester in physics, one of the things that is going to be discussed right away, uh, along with measurement, is observation. And and they will look you straight in the eye and go, yeah, well, when you look at it, then it changes. Right? It's like, what? You know, what kind of voodoo black magic is that? But they, this is the basic, the foundation, the fundamentals of, of quantum physics, but yet they don't want to talk about consciousness. 
you want to hear something really cool? It, this, is, this is one of my favorite examples that, you know, again, I encourage you to research and look into as well. This has been done many, many times. There, there's been proof of it, evidence as well. First of all, what you just said, Jimmy, is 100% accurate. It's something that anybody can look at where it's like the observation principle where when you look and when you don't look and it changes and like what the hell is going on, it's obviously something having to do with the observer and the consciousness of the observer. We'll take that a step further in a very real scenario. Let's say that I was a hypnotist, okay? And that, that was my profession. I was really good at it. And I put you, Jimmy, under hypnosis, and this has been done before. I'm just giving the example in a, in a you know personable way. I put you under hypnosis and I put your, your, uh, your best friend in front of you in between a clock. So there's a clock behind your best friend and your friend is standing in between you and the clock. The clock says 10.07. You obviously can't see that because there's somebody standing in front of it. And according to our limited perception, we'll never be able to see through a person because there's a person standing there, so you can't see the clock. But there have been many situations where the hypnotist is able to hypnotize the individual and convince the individual that that person is not standing there. And the individual can tell you exactly what time it is because they see the clock. Now, you tell me how the hell is that possible? Any other way other than what we're talking about with you creating your own reality through that mechanism of consciousness. It's unbelievable. <laughs> And uh, when we, okay, let's, <laughs> when we, when we, the, okay, it's like this. <laughs> this is how crazy it gets that uh, we are told that uh, there's more space in between atoms than there are atoms, right? That uh, to be able to feel something shouldn't happen. We should be able to pass our hand. We should be able to see through somebody, right? Okay, so we're told that. And then we are told that these particles um, have figured out that they want to be this. Some particles want to be Jason Shirka. The particles themselves are the same. So nature has figured it out. <laughs> Right, so I, it, cool. it's still like the crazy. So when when we talk about something as crazy as consciousness, and and the the same particles again, I'll, I'll I'll say it again: the same particles here are the same particles that are yapping into this microphone right now. How is that the the processes you're talking about? The eyes, right? Yeah. The amount of calculations that happen per second for you to see something let alone your entire environment and understand that that's a tree over there without looking at it, that that's a car, that's a person, that's a this, that's a that, there's this, there's a pen, whatever it is. And we're doing this a gazillion times in a nanosecond. And that encoding and decoding is happening at the same time. Same particles that are right here. And then somehow... We still have scientists that say that that <laughs> chance. What? I don't want to poo-poo on science. I love the James Webb telescope. No, we shouldn't. Science yeah, gives right. us science gives us these answers because science shows us exactly what we're talking about. It's the 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 some, not all. It's some of the scientists because, again, unfortunately, we're still operating out of limited perceptions. So we convey limited perceptions. But the problem is not science. Sci science gives us a lot of the answers. Uh, science gives us a lot of the answers. The, the problem, in my opinion, is the interpreters of that science. And I'll even say, go to religion. The problem is not the Bibles. The problem is the individual trying to interpret the Bible from a limited place, operating out of an egoic standpoint. That's where corruption comes from. That's where control comes from. So it's, it's, it's us as the interpreters that have to shift. It's not the science that needs to change because the science is based on a truth. We're the ones that are corrupting it. And I say we as humanity, you know, where, where we got to take responsibility for that and start moving past these limited belief systems where even to what you said, Jimmy, of we're physically made of the same thing. So what makes us different? 
There's got to be something here that makes us different. And then we have to ask the question, maybe it's more than physicality. Maybe Jimmy Church has a different light to his, you know, molecules and atoms than Jason does. And, and there is a different light. There is a different vibration of being that you have maybe minuscule, but we have different frequencies that we may be operating at. You know, you could, you could measure that too, but it's beyond what we see as measurement. So my point is, to, to what we're both saying here is we have to start looking beyond the physical realm. And if we only look into the physical realm, because that's where we have our ultimate certainty, we'll keep going in the same circle over and over again. We've become experts of the third dimensional realm. We know nothing about everything above it. And everything above it is very important to be able to operate in this 3D physical realm in a much more productive way. Is that what, um, uh, and I, I don't want to sound completely strange and, and bonkers here, Sure. but is that what love is? Is that what telepathy is? Two different things, right? But it is an entangled connection in mass, right? Where, where, where this is happening and, and we don't understand why. Is it two people that become entangled? Right. Is that what love is? And and this this entangled bond or telepathy or channeling or how E.T. is communicating between star systems. I'm, I'm so happy that you're you're choosing to go there right now, because in the world that we live in right now, I still see there are a lot of people that that whenever they hear love and speaking about love, somehow they turn it into this. It's new age and satanic. And I don't understand how anybody gets from love to new age and satanic because love is a frequency. Love is, is also, by the way, something that can be measured to an extent. You see a different aura to an individual that you can measure, a different energy to an individual when they're depressed versus when they're in love. So there is an energy to it. And I do believe that the difference between love and the opposite, let's say, would be coherent fields, mm -hmm. coherent energy, coherent movement versus incoherent and, and just a, a lot of distortion in a field that messes how energy moves through it. And there's proof for that as well. Name's Dr. Masaru Emoto. You probably heard of him before. He's done all experiments on water. Mm -hmm. Businessman, you know, nothing having to do with this. He had a hypothesis. He said, listen, is it possible that my emotions and that my words and that my feelings and that my intentions can impact the environment around me. And the way that he went to see whether that hypothesis is true or not, or how to answer that question in the first place was he took water. And water has a molecular formation. Again, anybody can, you know, even Google this and search this up anywhere. His name is Dr. Masaru, M-A-S-A-R-U, Emoto, E M. OTO. Unbelievable study, very simple. He said, I'm going to take water. First, let's acknowledge the fact that water does have a molecular structure to it. Now, if his hypothesis is correct, that words, thoughts, emotions, intentions can affect the environment around you and specifically water, then Holding or speaking to water in a negative way would change the molecular formation in a different way than speaking to water in a positive way. As mm -hmm. far as that sounds, we could test that under you know a molecular mi microscope and see what's actually going on in the formations of that water. And lo and behold, and this is something that everybody should definitely do their research on because you see the pictures themselves that he shared. When he did anything in the more coherent fields of love, of unity, of peace, of forgiveness, of compassion, you would always see a different shape, but always symmetrical, coherent formations of that water. Some look like snowflakes, all these different beautiful formations that you see real sacred, you know, even coherent shapes. When he did the opposite to that water. Angry, and, angry and water. Vision, all that. And looked under the, the molecular microscope and looked at those molecular formations, he saw distortions. He saw distorted figures and shapes. Now, why is that relevant? Why does that matter? 
Well, because you're made up of 70% water. I'm made up of 70% water. When I curse you and try to take you down, not only am I hurting you by ruining those formations of water that energy moves through in your body, because energy, water is a conduit that energy moves through. But in addition to hurting you when I'm cursing you, I'm also hurting me. Because when I'm speaking that hatred, I'm messing you up and I'm messing me up because that resonance is hitting all the water in that vicinity. So the reason why that's important is, again, when you understand that water is a conduit that energy moves through, and that's the difference between healthy bodies and diseased bodies. When there's no ease of a flow of energy to move through coherent formations of water in your body, energy gets stuck. Heart attacks, cancer, diabetes, depression, those things start to form because everything starts spiritually and energetically and ends up physically in this you know, world of, of the material. So when we understand everything that was just broken down, it's very simple stuff. This isn't you know, far-fetched stuff. This is stuff with evidence that we've seen done, that we've seen proven. You connect those dots and you see the power of love bringing back to, to what you said. Love brings us into coherency. Love, I do believe, is the, the formula here of fixing this world, of, of healing this world. The movie, The Fifth Element, what was The Fifth Element? It was love. It was love. And mm -hmm. I think that, that was a beautiful message of that movie. So I, I'm, I'm so, I'm just happy you, you brought that up because a lot of people. And, and here, you <laughs> oh man, I don't want to make light of, uh, of stuff, but, you know, take something like, uh, you know, if we discuss what entanglement is, where you've got particles that, you know, and so you bring two bodies together, right? And and something's going to happen. And if you do it over an extended period of time, well, I'll give you an example. Um, and you can use this in, in, in many different ways. But think of like a crew of a submarine, confined space, right? Underwater for two months, rubbing up against each other, right? The crew smelling each other and doing all of that. And then they come, they come up and they go, man, we're friends for life. Right? Yeah, of course you are. Yeah. That, that whole crew is entangled, right? Do you understand? They're friends for life. There's no way that that bond is going to be broken. And, and I, I believe that this is something that is real. When we, when we try to understand these concepts and when uh, physics is telling us about the multiverse or parallel worlds or 11 dimensions and string theory and, 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 and of course, uh, quantum entanglement, uh, entanglement uh, qubits, quantum computers, but observation, measurement, you start talking about all of this. This is truly uh, black magic stuff. But to understand how all of this works, it's it's almost faith where you have to apply that uh, to this observation, right? I, that I, really? Well, that's based on faith. Now, they can measure it and quantify it later. Right. But to under and, and for the rest of the world to understand this, there's something else here going on that we just don't understand. Jason, consciousness is the foundation of it. Jimmy, you know, another perfect example. You just reminded me of this one with the submarine example. Perfect example of entanglement, call it bioresonance, whatever you want to call it, mm -hmm. is when women live together, work together a lot of them start sinking their menstrual cycles. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like what? You mm -hmm. know, there is a field here that connects us. And not only is it that, take the menstrual cycle, for example, that you can sink with, you can also bring that to health and you can also bring that to sickness. So for, for a very long time, it's always believed to be that I'm getting you sick and you're getting me sick. And that's the only way that we can do something like that. But there's also a bioresonant field over here where instead of the germ that's getting you sick, it's also 
not the terrain on that side, but there is a bioresonant field over here where when enough people are getting sick, it's not that you're passing it to each other physically. Again, that's on the physical realm. It's more than that. It's you're tuning into this collective frequency of either sickness or health. And that can be productive and that can be counterproductive depending on the environment and the terrain that you're in. And uh, what I find interesting, um, another example of this, and and I love the water, um, uh, the two female roommates is a really good. Here's another one. Um, I, for, I forget the principle uh, that, uh, the name of this, but you lay out, say, 50 metronomes. Okay. Analog metronomes, right? Tick, tick, tick. Get them all out, start them up, and they're all different. They're all over the place. Give it a minute. They all sync hey. up. That's cool. Yeah, 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 yeah. Why? And, and when you watch, and uh, there's there's a lot of uh, explanations for this. They think that they've solved it. That part doesn't matter. It happens, right? And and, and we're talking about uh, you know something mechanical, right? That that this is something you wind it up, right? <laughs> and, and it goes and it does this. Uh, it's pretty incredible to watch. Oh, cool. Same thing with tuning forks, by the way. You you could have a hundred tuning forks in a room. And two of them are tuned to, let's say, 432 hertz. When you hit one, the only other tuning fork that's going to start vibrating without you touching it is the other one at 432 hertz. Is that right? Yeah. Now that makes sense too. Yeah. Yeah. I don't, I, yeah, I don't need to be, I don't need to be sold on that one. I'm already buying. I'm already <laughs> buying it. It's well, just how it works. Yeah. All these examples are perfect examples to show, you know, the, this greater unified field that everything is connected to. We need to take a break. Uh, let's get that in. Our guest tonight, the one and only Jason Sherka. I'll be right back. Stay with us. Oh, you know what? Hold on. Hold on. <laughs> hey, I didn't have it ready. So <laughs> I got to go like this. I got to go like this. And then I got to go like this. And then I can go. Our guest tonight is Jason Sherka. <laughs> <laughs> This is Jimmy Church of Fade to Black. Please visit all of our sponsors. We're taking a quick break here. All of the links are below, and we'll be right back. Check out Billy Carson's Forbidden Knowledge, forbiddenknowledge.com or forbiddenknowledge.tv, where you can get access to over 6,000 videos, movies, TV series, exclusive documentaries like The Black Knight Satellite. You can do it all for just $7.77 per month or $77 per year after the three-day trial, which is also totally free to check out. It's all simple to do. Billy Carson is the best. It's simple. ForbiddenKnowledge.com or ForbiddenKnowledge.tv. That's the number four, four BK. I will be hosting and emceeing the Conscious Life Expo this February 10th through the 13th at the LAX Hilton right here in Los Angeles, California. 200 speakers, including Linda Moulton Howe, Bashar, Deborah King, George Norrie, Daniel Sheehan, Scott Walter Shonstone, and David Wolf. Over 200 vendors, special events. This is the biggest event of its kind on planet Earth. You've got to come and hang out with all of us. Tickets and info at ConsciousLifeExpo.com. The links are below. On Saturday, April 1st, that's right, April Fool's Day, 2023, I will be hosting the Parapod Festival at the Hyatt Regency right here in Valencia, California. It's a live, one-day podcast awards. It's a film festival. It's a full-on media event. We're going to have Sky Watching. There's going to be a Lifetime Achievement Award presented to Linda Moulton Howe. Right now, you can submit your podcast, your film, your TV series, any of your paranormal media for consideration. You can do all of that on the links below. For info and tickets, go to parapodfilmfest.com. That's parapodfilmfest.com. April 7th through the 14th, 2023, I'll be hosting and presenting on the Hidden Secrets Seminar at Sea Cruise. 
From Los Angeles to the Mexican Riviera, I'm the navigator of the seas. That's right, up top, a giant water slide. You've got to check out the navigator of the seas. It's amazing. We've got Scott Walter, Adam Apollo, Nick Pope, Brad Olson, Vivian Chauvet, Jason Shirka, Robert Grant, Ruben Langdon, and another 12 amazing speakers and presenters. It's all simple to do. Just visit divinetravels.com forward slash hidden secrets 2023. You know you want to go on a cruise with me. River Moon Coffee, makers of the Fade to Black Blend. Truly the best coffee on planet Earth. Just visit rivermoonwellness.com or, or their Amazon store. It's all simple to do. You can check out the Fade to Black Blend, the Game Changer Blend, or any of their Black Moon Wellness products. It's the only coffee I drink. It is the best, and it's Doc. Again, rivermoonwellness.com all right welcome back i am your host jimmy church this is fade to black our guest tonight jason shirka and uh, uh jason uh you and i got two big events coming up uh, here very soon uh conscious life expo uh and uh the seminar at sea cruise and what are you going to be speaking about uh this time around at uh, the conscious life expo so this is going to be a really interesting one. Um, the name of my, my talk is called We Are the White Hats. And the purpose of the presentation, and it's going to be a long one with a lot of in-depth detail, but the overall purpose is to, you know, really remind people that this, this process that we're going through right now is not supposed to be something that we externalize to anybody outside of us. And there's been you know, a lot of narratives going on over the past two years, causing people to externalize their power. And even if that's for good reason, externalizing power is not something that I stand for whatsoever, because the only way we're getting out of this mess is by taking responsibility for ourselves and doing what needs to be done to make this world a better place, taking action instead of waiting for a savior to do it for us. So the reason why it's called We Are the White Hats is because again, a lot of people speak about white hat operations and there are a lot of things going on behind the scenes. Some things I'm even directly affiliated with, but that's not to be confused with the fact that we still have to do the work of humanity because humanity is responsible for humanity. And this isn't gonna end in terms of this you know, darkness in the world today by just waiting for the next savior to come and do it for us. So it's, it's gonna be me giving an in-depth background into my story over the past four years, I am affiliated with an organization known as TLS, The Light System. I will be speaking alongside Dr. Sandra Rose Michael, who, by the way, they approached back in 2011, so before I even knew they existed. And my job six months ago was to interview her and bring attention to her technology called the Energy Enhancement System, which is helping tons of people around the world today. So we're going to be speaking about that as well. I'm going to be bringing that up throughout the talk. There are going to be individuals that are affiliated with that that are going to be at the conversation at the, at the convention as well. And it's it's just going to be a really unique and different sort of presentation that I can I can definitely guarantee are going to be things that are shared there that you haven't heard from other individuals before simply because there are things going to, that I'm going to be sharing from my own personal experience with individuals that I've you know, had the privilege and honor to work with over the past few years behind the scenes, of course. And then uh, two weeks later, a seminar at Sea Cruise. Um, we'll be doing that together. Is that two weeks or That's two months? Two, two, three, man, I'm, I'm doing three two events months. back to back. <laughs> So, uh, but anyway, so uh, we're going to uh, head down through uh, the Mexican uh, Riviera together. And yeah. you and I are going to definitely hit that water slide together. On the, on oh, it's going to be great. It's going to be yeah, great. Be awesome. But uh, what are you going to do? Uh, what are you going to speak about on the cruise? Absolutely. So I, I want to bring in the component more in depth of the organization that I work with to give people more understandings. Ultimately, it's called the Hidden Secrets Cruise. So there's going to be things that... I'd like to reveal and disclose and share to the best of my ability, whatever I can at that point on the cruise as well, in person, in a very intimate way to give people a broader understanding of what is this organization? How do they work? Where are they from? You know, all, all the details that can be shared over there that I find amazing. And in addition to that, I'm also going to be doing a workshop on manifestation, teaching individuals actual formulas of 
How do we use speech, action, thought, the state of doing coupled with the state of being in a very practical way to create the world and to create the life that we want to live in? So I'm going to be offering actual formulas, not just philosophy here, but how to actually do it step by step by step. I've written a couple books about it, and I'm just going to be bringing that, you know, in the flesh and, and really giving a step by step work. Man, I'm in. I'm in. I'm in. It's going to be I'm good. In. I'm in, I'm in. Well, I, I have to be in. We're on a boat together. <laughs> um, the uh, the idea, and I'm glad uh, that you brought up uh, water structure and negativity and and how our bodies are you know made up of water, right? Mm-hmm. And and there is uh, something I discovered that not because of YouTube and those videos are incredible, by the way, they're incredible. Not because of that. I I went through a physical thing uh, watching the news one day and I didn't, I I had done three or four days without the news. I was off, you know, conference. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, walk through the house, turn on the TV, you know, the news is on, whatever, you know, ISIS burning people in cages, whatever it was. Right. And it's, I was like, I'm done. I'm done. I, I physically, I, I felt it and I didn't dig it. I haven't watched the news since I haven't, I have not. It's been, this is uh we're almost in 2023. So I'm going to say eight years probably. Wow. Of, 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 yeah. of but um, I, I don't let it affect me. Yeah. And I apply that same modality to social media. Now, I use social media for as a tool for my own reasons, but I don't use it for negativity. And I not only don't spread it, but I don't allow it to affect me. But today, externally, the giver and taker of, of these things that happen on social media is starting to affect the world in a global sense. And people want to say, we're all angry. Everybody's fighting. Everybody's doing, and, and they don't want to uh, address the problem. Right. And is social media affecting our water right <laughs> in our bodies? I think, I think anything that leads you, I'm going to change the word think to it's a fact because we've seen these studies Anything that impacts you negatively is impacting the water in your body. That's why it's impacting me negatively. If it's bringing up feelings of of jealousy, of animosity, of feeling left out, of anger, of any of that, those are all frequencies. That's what emotions are. They can be measured in frequency, energy, vibration that literally distort the water in your body. And thus, again, as we said earlier, lead you to a body that isn't coherent anymore. And when you have a body that's not coherent anymore, you have dis-ease. Dis-ease in the body calls and causes for for, those manifestations of diseases to, to come up. So I use social media in the same way you do. It's my job. It's what I do, you know, every day. I'm on it often, but not as a receiver on that. I'm on that to do what I'm here to do and I leave and then I go open up my books and I read and I write and I, and I do what I got to do. And I, I, I stay in that world to the best of my ability. Do I get distracted sometimes? Yes, because we're human and you can get scrolling and it keeps going and never ends. But I, I don't generally use social media as a tool to consume. I use social media as a tool to produce. And now uh, let's change gears. Uh, let's uh let's uh, we're at a fork in the road we're gonna go right i was gonna go left let's go right let's go right um the uh the two two areas we're gonna jump into one um is et uh-huh. i've seen a lot of crazy things okay <laughs> I, have, I have i have i haven't been abducted i haven't been on some uh, operating table, you know, stainless steel in a round room. Haven't, haven't gone that far yet. Um, that I know of, but I've seen a lot of strange things and it seems that the strange things that happened 
weren't coincidence. It was almost an invitation. And without going, you know, straight to crazy town here, there seems to be a connection. How would E.T. know that me and my friends on planet Earth at a very small spot, right? How would they know that we are saying, show yourselves? How, how, how does that happen? There's 8 billion people on this planet. To make it simple, something called universal awareness. How does the cell in your pinky toe know, or let me change that. How does the, the brain know when there's something going on in the cell in your pinky toe or in your pinky toe? It's very far compared to the size of the body. It's trillions of cells away and yet it, it knows. And it knows because within our bodies, there's a universal awareness, there's an interconnectivity. So what happens on one side impacts the other and everything can feel everything, whether we feel it consciously or not is a whole different story, but everything can feel everything in the body. I think that that's what we need to get to as human beings, by the way, a state of collective universal awareness. We know we're not there, by the way, because so long as there is a starving child in Africa, you know, there's a genocide going on in Syria, all these things that are going on and we're just okay with it. We know that we're numb to that universal awareness. I would go as to say these races that you're talking about that have this knowledge, that have this feeling are connected to something that we're numb to that eventually we will wake up to, which is a state of universal awareness. It's a, it's a spiritually advanced state. And I'm confident to say that even on the logical level that, that we can kind of break down over here, because we know that if they can get here and we don't know how to get there just yet publicly, at least mm -hmm. they must be more advanced than us physically. And if they're more advanced than us physically and they're that advanced and they still haven't wiped themselves out like we did back in Atlantis, they must have the spiritual maturity to go with it, which means that, I think it's fair to say that universal awareness, that spiritual advancement is probably a part of their day-to-day -day life. Um, I think that that would have to be the case because they haven't invaded us. Yeah, <laughs> that's another thing. You know, where do we hear about invasions and all that? Right. Oh. No, continue. It, it, it's all 70 years ago. There's been There's been a campaign. Of when you think UFO, you think invasion. When you think alien, you think abduction. And everything that they've had us associate with ETs, which is negative in many ways, with the exception of the movie ET, everything that they've had us associate with ETs is not what we experience in our physical life. So why is that the association? And then we have to start asking, well, who's funding these movies? Who's behind these industries? And what would they lose if we thought the opposite of what those movies are trying to tell us and what they would lose is all of their power. The reason for that is because let's take the opposite of what they're telling us about ETs. Let's say that they're positive entities here, not to come and kill you and hurt you and invade you, but here to connect with you and unite with you intergalactically. And let's say they did have this technology, which I think is very fair to say that, you know, it's pretty obvious at this point, but they do have this technology that travels in ways that our technology does not work at quite yet. Intergalactically, interdimensionally, anti-gravitational crafts, things like that, with no gasoline or oil whatsoever. If we were to have that technology out in the public today, you'd have trillions of dollars worth of industries go bust overnight. And it just so happens to be that the people behind Hollywood and the movies and all that are directly correlated to those very, very big corporations. So if we follow the money, it becomes very obvious where the motive is to keep us indoctrinated to believe something about these beings that they've never even proved to be the case, not in our physical experience at all whatsoever. So I think we have to start, you know, asking ourselves those questions again, is what we accepted as a truth of they're bad, they're evil, they're satanic, they're, they're demonic, they're this, is it true or is, is it possible that it's not true? Is it possible that there are races out there that are here to unite with us? And again, I'm not giving a conclusion or an answer here. I'm just, I'm, I'm saying, I think we have to start asking that question instead of just, you know, 
saying this is the way it is because this is the, these are the programs that we've been taught to believe. We had two amazing breakthroughs uh, this week. Uh, astounding, uh, big, big things that were announced. First, last week, was the announcement of the creation of a wormhole. Lawrence Livermore Labs and the creation of a wormhole and the passing of uh, quantum data through it. And in the press release, it stated that this information was indeed teleported. Now, their words, not mm -hmm. mine. Sounds like I, I wrote that press release, right? Um, mm -hmm. and, and then the you know, there's always the disclaimer at the end. We're not saying that we're ready to pass humans uh, through this, but this is the future. So that we had that breakthrough. I want your comment on that because that is truly the answer to uh, traveling to the stars and and an acceptance into some galactic brotherhood sisterhood is the ability to go and see our neighbors and and friends. Uh, there's that, and then of course yesterday, uh, it was two days ago the press release came out. But yesterday, uh, our government uh, came out and said. We have indeed uh, achieved fusion. So and that that that's too too huge, right? Right at the top of it. I don't know what would be bigger than these two achievements, other than, uh, of course, the discovery of of uh, our uh, ET brothers and sisters out there would would probably uh, trump that. Uh, ooh, did I say that? Did I just go orange? I didn't mean to go on, <laughs> but, uh, and you, you understand what I'm saying? Two, two huge achievements, uh, in the same week. So I'm going to, I'm going to really say something very simple here, but I, I really do believe that it's like the foundation to moving into the next steps in a responsible way. Both of the things that you just explained are very powerful and with a lot of power comes a lot of responsibility. By the way, I don't believe those things just happened two days ago. No, they did not. They're, they, all these things have been happening for a very, very long time. This is nothing new. You know, It's not a new discovery. It's just new to the public in the way that it's coming out. That, that's a whole other narrative, but that's, that's besides the point. My point is, is if we continue going down this physical technological advancement without, and I'm going to bring it back to spirituality because we have to, if we, if we continue advancing physically with our technology, without maturing spiritually to understand how to use that technology, we will have a repeat of things that have happened in the past that have been wiped out of our history books, Atlantis being one of them. The problem in Atlantis was the physical technology and the technological developments were surpassing their spiritual maturity and what happens there. You don't know how to use what's in your hands. You're going to kill yourself. You're going to wipe yourself out. It's inevitable if you don't have that spiritual maturity to operate what it is that you're working on and working with in your hands. We are at a very, very big turning point with those breakthroughs. And I, and I do this because they're not breakthroughs, but they are now publicly being spoken about. And when they're publicly being spoken about, they will start being publicly used because there has been disclosure. So I call it more of a disclosure than a breakthrough because it's disclosure. It's been here for a long time. So with that in mind, we must, this, this is a, a fork in the road. Right now, we're experiencing it. And the question is, what are we going to choose to do? Are we going to take this and not be mature with it and not be responsible with it? That will be our demise. And we're going to have a big wipeout event. And we're going to start fresh. And you know, we'll, we'll try it all over again. That doesn't need to happen. It's happened many times in the past. We don't need to repeat that history over again if we can learn from our history. Option number two, which I think is the obvious one that we, we should probably take, is let's begin working on ourselves consciously, 
on ourselves, on our level of awareness, universal awareness, understanding our interconnectivity. So long as we think that we truly live in a divided world without an interconnection between all, we will use this technology in a horrific way. And by the way, right now we still live in that divided world. That's why pharmaceutical industry works on reductionism, not holism. Reductionism means take this pill. It's going to help your heart, but going to give you diabetes. Those are the side effects. Take this pill. It's going to help your diabetes, but your liver is going to be shot. You know, mm -hmm. take this pill. It's going to help your acne, but you you're, might have kidney failure because we're not operating in a holistic universal way of universal awareness. That will be reflected everywhere else. There's tons of examples I can give of that, but it's not necessary right now. The principle here is in order for those things to be used the right way, and they're not bad, they could be used in a bad way, they could be used in incredible ways. We must start focusing on our level of spirituality. And that, by the way, does not negate religion. That means that if you practice Judaism, Christianity, Islam, Buddhism, whatever it may be, if you haven't paid attention, they all say the same thing in a different way. So follow your path, follow what speaks to you, follow what you want to follow, but find the principles that it's built on. They're all built on love. It's the interpreters, the leaders that turned it into division and corruption and hatred. That, that's not what we need here anymore. So I'm not telling you to move away from religion by telling you to move into spirituality. And I don't want anybody to hear that. What I'm saying is move into the spirituality within the religion that you identify with. And ultimately, we will all come to that same place of we may be different, but we respect each other. And that's the unity that we're talking about. Yeah, yeah. I go to the church of Wu. That's, <laughs> that's my church. I'm the reverend. I love it. You're you're invited, man. Uh, it's love an open it. congregation. I love it. I, love it. Um, I was uh, 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 talking to my doctor, you know, last week, and and we were having a conversation about this, and mm -hmm. and you know what? I I, I kind of freaked him out, right? I had to I had to do a, an annual checkup, right? Okay, so whatever. I said he goes, you don't come see me. I go, no, nope. no reason to. Well, yeah, but no, man. I'll come to you when I break my arm. That's when I come see you, right? <laughs> when I need you. The rest of it, I'll just take care of me, man, and 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 I'm okay. I don't want uh, a medicine cabinet full of stuff. I don't want to be told things, you know. And and there's a masculine, feminine way of of looking at this too, as well. I think men don't want to know. Right, men don't want to know. We're, if, if 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 I'm not falling downstairs, I'm okay. Right, and and there's no need. Women look at it differently, right, and which is fine. That's why we are who we are. But I don't. Uh, I think the power of the mind. I'm not saying that I can defeat everything. I'm not. But if I have a positive attitude, it's like that glass of water. Right. And, and, and I'm okay. I, you know, I've made, I'm 60, I'm 60. I'm good, man. I'm good. Whatever happens from here on out is going to happen, <laughs> it's, it's, you know, but I'm not going to freak myself out uh, about it. And, and I'm not going to, uh, uh, um, how do I say this? Um, medicate and then medicate the medications. Yeah. I'm not, I'm just not, I'm not going to, I just don't want to go down that road. And now here's the other thing. Um, we were just talking about ET and consciousness. Um, the second part to that conversation is um, when we talk about consciousness, NDEs, right? Ev everything that's going on out there and it could be the light at the end of the tunnel and it, it could be something, whatever it may be. Um, and then it, it jump into reincarnation or this and that, or maybe, you know, going to another star system and, and, and living a life there. Um, I don't think it's one of the great mysteries, certainly, uh, that is out there that we don't have real answers for, but does consciousness itself after your physical meat suit stops running, right? Uh, is that something that just ventures out and, and explores? 
It's a great question. I don't remember being there to be able to tell you. So I know, right? Let's, let's use let's use what we do know, right? When a tree dies, falls over in the rainforest, there's a few things that happen there. Bugs come make new homes, eat from that decomposing bark. Um, from there, you got mushrooms, you know, fungus that starts growing out of that. From there, you have new trees, new bushes, new, new, new life that is coming out of that. So the question we got to ask ourselves is, it, if life is coming out of that dead tree, did it ever really die? And the further question would be, can life come out of anything dead? And I, I think the obvious answer is no. Life can only come out of life. Life cannot come out of anything dead. Even the word decompose, let's, let's think about that for a second. To decompose doesn't mean to die. To decompose just means to take the same thing that you're made of, I'm made of, and the tree's made of, and then decompose in order to do what? To recompose. Mm -hmm. So it, 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 there's this like sick, cyclical sort of you know thing that happens where it falls apart and then reforms and comes together. Same energy, different form. Maybe that same energy is now broken up into different parts. That's not to say that the consciousness is broken up into individual parts because that consciousness is whole in every part that it's in. Back to the hologram example that we gave in, the, in you know, about an hour ago. So what I believe is just that. Albert Einstein said, look deep into nature and you'll understand everything a whole lot better. It's one of my favorite quotes. And when we look deep into nature, not that deep, we see that what people call woo-woo reincarnation is really just the recycling of energy. And that's as scientific as it gets because we see it happen all the time. So if you were to die, right, your meat suit would be not animated anymore, whatever that means. And I were to put you on a grass field, what would happen? The meat suit, the body, the vessel would decompose and actually become food for the soil in that grass. It would become food for animals. So there must still be life somewhere in there that's giving life to everything else around it and moving on. Now the question is, the awareness of Jimmy Church, where does that go? How does that work? I don't know. That's that's beyond my, you know, my scope at the moment. But to to you know be confident enough to say that the energy does move on and continue and transform that's as evident as, as we can get because we see it happen every day. Do you think we'll ever find out? You know, I, I, I bet I'm not a betting man, but I would make this bet. I would go to Vegas. I would, I would, I would pop the money down on this. I would bet that prehistoric man, the ones that painted in the last call caves, right. In France, right. <laughs> Doing those cave paintings, you know, 30,000 years ago that even that version of us was thinking about what happens after we die. This is like the ultimate question. Are we alone in the universe? Yeah, that's, that's up there. I'm prehistoric man was probably thinking about that too, but it's like the ultimate question. Do you think we'll ever get those answers? We can talk to the Danny and Brinkley's of the world and he's brilliant. Man's been struck by lightning like 35 times, right? And has come back to 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 tell us about it. That's one thing. But is do you think that we'll ever find out? Well, you know, those answers are out there. The question is, do you want to accept them as answers? So, first of all, there are many, 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 many people, many people at this point, you know, books, big doctors that have experienced this, you know, many articles written about this of people experiencing near-death experiences, all having a very similar experience throughout many different time periods in this world, experiencing what they experience, see what they see, and come back. There are many other people that come and tell you, listen, I remember where I was. I remember where my awareness was. The problem is all of us look, turn our heads, and start laughing because that's crazy for us to be able to fathom collectively at the point that we're at right now. So let's break it down again back to Egypt and that stone that you sat on. That stone has information. It has a memory. And that memory has lasted for a very long time and you somehow connected to that. So you asked a very important question. You said, do you think we'll, be, we'll ever know? And my answer, almost factually speaking, would be you already know. You just need to remember. 
because you were there. Yeah, kind of. I'm, I'm not being argumentative. No, no, no. And please, if you don't agree with me, let's let's no, do. No, 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 no. I, do I, don't, I don't know if I agree with you, um, but I'll say this: I was uh, 21. I'm a kid, right? I'm a doofus. Well, I'm okay. still a doofus, but I was a 21 year old version of me, uh, super doofus. Mm -hmm. And um, and my roommate at the time. Um, Olivier, uh, who I still talk to, and we're still friends to this day, great guy. But he he was this really smart guy, right? Person of the world, French, you know, uh, all of that. And he says to me one day, I'm 21. He goes, you know what happens when you die, right? I'm like, no, what? What happens, Olivier? He goes, This. I go, what's that? He goes, that's it. It's over. I go, what do you mean? Dude, you just achieve your place in evolution. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, but, the, the, you know, you know, uh, my spirit, my, you know, my kind of my soul. And no, 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 no. That all dies with you. It's over. And it ruined me for, yeah, I, I would say for about a month, my dick was in the dirt. OK, where I couldn't focus. It was such a paradigm shifting thought process where it just it was not what what I wanted to hear. It wasn't what I wanted to believe. But it's that atheist, pragmatic, black and white thing that sometimes makes sense. Right. And your cognitive dissonance. Right. You got your blinders on. You don't want to hear anything like that. And in instead of. It 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 ruined me for about a month. I mean, I couldn't concentrate. I, I really was reading a lot of books and trying to collect uh, answers on this. But what it did ultimately is it swung me in the other direction. Okay. Okay. I, it didn't. It it didn't. It didn't change my belief system. It, it, what it did was it cemented my core belief system. It made it stronger. And that, I, 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 that, that The universe is a powerful big place. And there's something going on that we don't understand. You know, it's not about we die and it's over, right? And existence ends at that moment. No, I just, I, I don't believe that. He freaked me out. And there are plenty, it, it, it caused me to go and do more research and think about myself and look inside of myself. That's what it did. But there are plenty of uh, individuals like Olivier, my roommate, that walk around with this belief system. And there's, there's no, they, they, they are okay with that. And they don't think about sure. the For possibilities. Sure. But then, but then we throw some wrenches into that, that, that brings up really interesting thoughts. For example, Past life regression therapy. Mm -hmm. Let's 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 be a, a skeptic and say it's just your imagination. But there are some things that can't be your imagination. For example, let's say, and this has happened many times, by the way. Let's say you are you as Jimmy, right? Let's say I I know how to put you under you know a past life regression. And obviously I can't do that, but there are people that know how to do that, like Dr. Brian Weiss, people like that, and his students. Let's say I do that to you, you go under. You agree with me, you don't know ancient Greek, right? You don't know how to speak ancient Greek if you try. Not, that I, not, not this week. <laughs> not this week. You know, an ancient language that that is just not spoken anymore. And suddenly I put you under the regression. I'm and speaking start, Aramaic or something. You start telling me about who you were 3,000 years ago in a language that not only you don't know, but most people don't know, and you need a really, really special translator to come in. Make of that what you want. That's interesting. Alan Watts has a quote, and I'm just going to paraphrase because I don't remember what it, what it was exactly, but he said, I want you to imagine what's it like, or he asked the question, what's it like when you go to sleep and never wake up, that's called death. But what was it like when you woke up 
after never having gone to sleep. That's called birth. Mm. Ooh, that's tasty. That's tasty. Yeah, that's tasty. That's, and tasty. that's, that's the exact opposite side of what Olivier said. Yeah. So he focused on the death, right, of the end. But when was the beginning? When did you when did you go to sleep to wake up? You didn't. So there were, there was a continuation of something there. Right. And where you come from can be where you go, where that place is. Whole different story. Right. That that's where we go into the real unknown of there is just I, I don't know what to say on that part. Have but, you had have you had an NDE? Have you had a tragic but, I do remember past life experiences. Okay, but no, have you have you died as an adult? No. Okay. No. Um, I don't know if I did, but I came close. I'm mm -hmm. not going to get in. It, it's it, it, you and I will talk later. Okay, and and I'll, I'll I'll give you the whole rundown on this thing. But uh, I was I was 20. I, I, I'm in the hospital for about a month, but the first four days in the hospital. Uh, I was in a coma. I was out. And I entered the coma um, when I was being admitted. And um, so the doctor comes in, and it happened just like this. Doctor comes in, like three doctors, four doctors, clipboards. Okay, uh, Jimmy, uh, uh, we got a situation. Okay, well, you know, and I was in a lot of pain. We got a situation. Okay, uh, you're going you're gonna to be here for a few days. And I was like, what? You know, I thought I was going to get, you know, a shot in the butt or whatever, you know, when I'm going home. And I passed out right then. I don't remember. It just boom. And I wake up four days later. Now, here's, um, here's the thing with that. I was in a place that was nothing like that's been described to me from other people that have, have, experienced these things. Okay. Um, but I liked it. All right. When I came out of the coma, um, which was a weird thing, but, um, I was pretty upset because I was in a good place, man. I was in a real good place. And I remember, uh, there was a priest next to me, literally with a Bible. Oh, you're, you're back. I was like, what? Where am I? He run, He's hitting buttons and the doctors come in. <laughs> you know what I'm doing? I'm like Dorothy clicking my heels three times, right? I'm closing my eyes. Dude, I just want to go back. I want to go back. I want to go back. I want to go back because it was, it was pretty cool. But it wasn't like anything else that I had been told since then. A lot of, a lot of people, you know, I've read the books. I've had the doctors on, on this program that have told me what they have experienced and, 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 and things. Um, it was nothing like mine, nothing. And now I, I find out it was about two weeks later. I'm still in the hospital, the night nurse. Um, I should write a book about this. I could, I could probably put it all down, uh, before I forget it. Uh, before I leave this <laughs> meat sack, <laughs> is um, uh, so this nurse, little black chick, she was probably 22. Her name was Tiny. Um, sure. And uh, it, seriously, she goes, okay, I'm not supposed to tell you this. I go, what's up? You scared us. Oh, what are you talking about? <laughs> I swear to God, I was such a doof. You came and went like every four hours. Came and went where? What? What are you talking about? You know when you first came in? Yeah, 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 yeah. And she tells me this, and then it all made sense. Jason, I was like, that's what was going on. But I was in I was in a place of bliss, man. Yeah, 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 yeah. I've told the story many times. So I, uh, I've had, I've had situate multiple situations where for example i had like a staph infection in my leg it almost killed me i didn't get to the point of you know seeing myself outside of my body mm -hmm. and de but there was a point where i had to accept certain things as as a potential and during that acceptance phase it was the most peaceful you know i've ever felt in my life i was also young you know it, 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 uh check this out just, I want you to visualize uh, this. 
uh, everybody else can too as well. Okay. This is where I was. I was in, I was sitting at a table in a chair. There was a light lighting up the table. Okay. And I was writing sheet music and I could hear the symphony. I could hear the music wow. that I'm writing. Okay. But the room that I was in, no floor, couldn't see walls, couldn't see, it was all black. So it was as if this table is sitting on, you know, it's floating in space or, or whatever. I didn't think that, uh, you know, that's not what I was saying. But, but imagine that, right? Just all blackness, table, chair, and a, a light that was lighting up the table. And for four days, I'm writing music out. Isn't that nuts? Nothing else, not nothing, nothing crazy. Not, not it wasn't a dream. It wasn't, you know, the dreams that we have or or anything. No, it was just that. Question. Let's talk about dreams for a second. What's the difference between a reality in your dream state and a reality in your waking state? Uh in, in my opinion, yeah. My opinion, uh, I think the dream state is a parallel world. I think it's a reality as real as this. We're just going there um, uh, while we sleep. That's but what in, I mean. in the dream state, you could still smell things. You could still, yeah, uh -huh. things. you know, you could, it's, it feels just as real. It, it, it is real. I think you're going to another parallel dimension. You're, you, it's I, just, I think that's, that's even more evidence of, how consciousness is kink, how consciousness creates reality. Because well, what about ayahuasca, right? I've never done it, so I can't speak on it. Oh, I do it every day. I'm doing it right now. I've never done it. So I've never done it. I don't do drugs. <laughs> don't do drugs. <laughs> Sounded convincing, though, for a second. You see Jason, he's like, what? Really? I, 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 do see, I do see things like ayahuasca and psilocybin and whatnot. I, I, I believe if you use it as a medicine, great. I, I do think a lot of people, unfortunately, abuse it. You know, yeah, so. yeah. So um, other other drugs, right? Uh, uh, whatever you know, LSD, psilocybin, mushrooms, and 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 what have you. That's it. That's a different class. That's a different category. And I wouldn't even just to right. be clear from from where I come from, I wouldn't call mushrooms drugs, and I wouldn't call ayahuasca drugs. I would only call it a drug if the user is using it in in. I'm just having a good time. Yeah, if the well, user is a patient and needs it for medicine, I would right. call it medicine. Yeah, okay. Well, you and I differ there. Sure. Mushrooms, recreational drugs. Okay. <laughs> sure, you can, sure. I mean, pot, pot is, is something else. You can, you know, you can elevate your consciousness in your mind and, and stuff and expand things. But no, different class. Ayahuasca, um, DMT is 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 in our body naturally, right? <laughs> And so what I, I believe I, I've never done it, right. I'm, I'm, I'm well at some point, uh, I've, I've got to go and check it out, but I've never done it. But DMT ayahuasca allows the DMT to uh, be produced in your body, right? So that's what it does. Ayahuasca itself isn't the drug. It's what's forcing the DMT to release in your body. Um, the DMT that you smoke, that's a different situation, um, altogether, but I think that that is something that can be clinically addressed where you are stepping into another dimension, a parallel world, another reality that exists alongside our own. Um, mushrooms and and pot and whatever no, that's not, that's not doing what DMT is doing. Uh, DMT is 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 accessing another plane of existence, and I think it's something that clinically should be uh, uh, looked at. When, you know, physics is trying to show us these eleven dimensions in string theory. Well, maybe maybe you need to check out what DMT is doing um, because it may be doing just that. And uh, I think it's right don't there. In front of don't us. you feel like when they, when they do, I feel like when they do clinical things with stuff, they just end up messing with it. 
because <laughs> then you got, you know, the corporations come in and then they want to patent something and to patent something, you got to make it a synthetic version to be able to sell it and make it your own. Then it takes this, like the, 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 almost like the sacred out of, you know, the, the natural aspect of it, mm -hmm. because it, it's become commercialized. Again, I've never done any of those things. So I can't speak on them in terms of personal experience, but I think it's a, it's an interesting conversation to have. Well, what you do see, you know, this problem that we have with physics, right? Mm -hmm. Quantum physics and, and, and the consciousness conversation. If you want to change some atheist doofus like a Richard Dawkins, right? Or uh, a Sean Carroll, you know, uh, you know, uh, uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson, right? Any, any one of these rock star doofus physicists. And and you you want them to Dawkins isn't a physicist by the way but but you understand what I'm saying, um, let them do some ayahuasca, and that, that consciousness conversation will change. I agree. I, I definitely agree. I, I don't understand how these people get to such high. I actually I do understand they get to such high places in the world with such a limited perspective, but. I guess I answered my own question. I think it's because the world is still limited, you know, in our, in our collective perspective of, of how we perceive things, you know? That yeah. 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 You're, you're right about that. And there's uh, probably the other hurdle, right? The other stumbling block, which I have mad respect for. It's a tremendous amount of education and study, right? Yeah. To, to lay out algorithms like that and to understand math and to get these equations uh, to communicate with you to answer the the complex questions of of the universe and us that's that's a lot of dedication and okay. so it's a it's a time management thing right where uh, you know i'm a little busy with the string theory thing it's going to take me another 20 years you know and to pull them off of something like that and diving into consciousness that's where I have to back up and and uh, and and respect, you know, some boundaries here. But the problem that I have with it is that uh, science in general used to be about thinking outside of the box. That's how we progress, right? You've got somebody that is thinking outside of the box, like you were saying. You brought up radio waves, right? Well, if you weren't thinking outside of the box, that would have never happened. The wheel would have never happened if you weren't thinking outside of the box. Uh, and and That's everything right. else. <laughs> now thinking outside of the box becomes very dangerous for certain people. Nobody wants life. to do it. Everybody wants to stay in their lane. Because if we were to continue thinking out of the box beyond where we're already, again, follow the money, very big corporations would lose a lot of money. Because the next step they become non-existent. You don't need things like gasoline and oil to propel you from one side of the planet to another. And they don't want you to know that. And that's where the conflicts of interests, you know, exist. You know, I, I, I am a walking paradox, though. Um, and I'll tell you why. I, I love a V8. I love muscle. I love a I have, to, have you ever heard a 1965 Ferrari V12 GTO 250 startup that mechanical thing with the cams and the chains and this thing and the, this McKev dude dude it's <laughs> Beethoven right I love that and and I I don't ever want that to go away on the other hand, we need to figure this out. And I hate big oil, <laughs> right? I'm like, a walk. you know, you know, Harley Davidson's are pretty friggin' cool, man. I, you but know, I, I, I don't see a problem I, with that. I don't yeah. see a problem, you know, like enjoy the things that are in front of us and have a good time with it. Enjoy the good things in life. And, you know, it doesn't mean we can't work to something better, big picture that can help more people. You know, it's, it's like, it's almost like if you're, if you're, Take spirituality, a spiritual teacher. Does that mean you can't have a nice car? No, of course yeah, you can. Yeah, 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 yeah. Billy Carson's yeah. book uh, that he wrote, Woke Doesn't Mean Broke, right? Oh, <laughs> it's like, 
<laughs> it doesn't mean you can't have a good time. It doesn't mean you can't live in a nice home. It doesn't mean you can't have a pool in your backyard. It doesn't mean you can't enjoy the physical things because you teach the spiritual side of life. It means that you, you balance between the two and you have a great time living in your physical body while teaching people why they came here and reminding people why they came here in the first place. It's, it's really as simple as that. Yeah, because free energy isn't about me giving up uh, a Harley Davidson or a 1966 Mustang 2 plus 2, right? But what it means is uh, food production, the transportation of, of things, heating and cooling our schools. You know, that, that's, what, that's, that's free energy. Um, and and th it doesn't mean that we have to give up some things that, that, that are really cool and that, that, that give us happiness. And one Adva of advancing in technology doesn't mean we have to eradicate anything that came before. No, I'm not giving up a four barrel carburetor. No, listen, my my uh, perfect example. You can have a, a 1976 Cadillac Eldorado. We're still in the year 2022, about to be 2023. You know, does that mean that because it's 1976 and it, it's not an effective engine and it's three miles per gallon, you can't drive it? It's still a beautiful car. It's still an antique. You know, and you could still have it and enjoy it. So it, it's. It, just because something progresses and advances doesn't mean everything before it becomes obsolete overnight. It means that in many cases, those things become antiques, you know, and, and, and collectibles and people enjoy it and have a good time and keep doing their thing. But the world keeps moving forward. And today, and in, in even the car realm, I mean, we're, we're already in like futuristic electric cars that don't have steering wheels and drive themselves. But you still got the people with the 1976 Cadillac Eldorado having a good time without seatbelts because they don't need it because it's considered an antique and, you know, with leather, leather seats and old radios and they like it. So just because we progress in that way with free energy doesn't mean you can't have that, you know, Harley Davidson or whatever it is. It's just, let's continue moving in the proper direction. That's it. Do you think um, with our evolutionary process here um, that any extraterrestrial civilization would have gone through the same things. And I'm not talking about overcoming, you know, health issues or uh, averting asteroid attacks or another alien invasion or, um, uh, uh, you know, killing themselves with nuclear weapons. No, I'm, I'm, I'm saying the, the other things that they went through theater, comedy, music, the arts, uh, a 1976 Cadillac Eldorado right? That they went through the same evolutionary in their own way, but they must have had to go through the same things that, that we go through too. And therefore, if we're understanding that, then they would have elevated if they survived that asteroid impact, right? <laughs> or, or an alien invasion. If they survive that, they grow up and mature, yeah, I guess, I mean, I, we don't know exactly what they've gone through, but I guess the principle has to be the principle. You know, they, they, they have to keep, even today, even as advanced civilizations, let's say, if they're that right now, they still got to be evolving all the time. You know, that, that evolution doesn't stop if you're still in that physical vessel and that physical body. So I'm sure that they've had to go through some sort of, you know, evolution like us, maybe not in the same exact way, but uh, I guess the, the best people to ask are the people that have, you know, had the honor and privilege of visiting those other planets. And they exist. Yeah, yeah. Uh, one last question and fantastic conversation tonight, man. That's I can't wait to do it again with you. Yeah. Um, is there a God? Is there a God? Is there a God that, as represented by any religion right here on Earth, is there a God or is there something else? So I don't even know how to answer that question because how, how can there, first of all, let's define God. Are we speaking? Okay. About okay. God? I'll define it for you. Is yeah. there a God? Is God the one that I have to go to a special building and donate money so I can get to heaven? Is there that? Is that something that I, mean, I, I think it's pretty obvious in the times that we live in and sorry if I offend some people, but I think we're past that. Okay. You know? 
so if, 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 if so let's take that off the table that's a good answer by the way okay so let's take that off the table that was easy there must be something divine that not only created this universe but all the other universes out there that are running at the same time well how and about this it's really old 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 let's take it even a step further let's not separate between a god and creation I call creation God. I call existence God. I call consciousness God. There is nothing outside of God. There is no God and X. I see God as infinite, abundant, eternal light and consciousness. I know people will hear those words and say, buzzwords, new age, this, that. It's just what it is. Energy cannot be created or destroyed. Energy is infinite in and of itself. That's something we've proven even physically and beyond. So the way that I would define God is by not defining God. Instead of saying there's a Jewish God or a Muslim God or a Christian God, or you do this and you're sinning and you're going to be punished. No, God is the only thing that exists, which inherently is good. It's us through our free will, which is also a part of God that chooses how we want to connect with that eternal being, with that eternal consciousness, with that eternal light of good. And what we call punishment is not God punishing us. That's not how that works. There is no judgment in, in a source of goodness. Mm -hmm. The way that I see it personally is what we perceive as punishment is our, whether conscious or subconscious choice of not aligning with that ultimate light with that ultimate good that's where our free will comes in we could choose to do things to hurt people we could choose to do things to help people but the way that i see god is not as a man with a white beard in the closet that's going to come and hurt you if you do something bad the way that i see god is a is the, the only field that exists which is a unified field of consciousness that connects everything that is aware of everything that includes everything and that nothing can exist without so Again, not God and X God. That's where it is. You know how I know there's a God? That water slide, a uh, navigator of the seas that you and I are going to be putting the heart to in a few months. Jason, thank you so much, my friend. Where can everybody reach out to you? How can they find you? Really? I mean, it's, it's a good question. <laughs> I do have uh, social media channels, uh, YouTube Instagram, just Jason Shirk. I will say there are scammers out there. There are people out there that pretend to be me. And, and unfortunately, they're not me. Fortunately, they're not me. I will never go and, you know, ask you for money to do a psychic reading or things like that. I say that because if anybody does follow me on YouTube or Instagram and you're a new follower or subscriber, you will see that. So just be cautious of that. Please don't interact with them. Please stay away from that. And just know that there's only one of me, and those are the bigger accounts that you're going to see on social media, Instagram, YouTube, Facebook, and of course on Unified. Unified.tv is where I put a lot of my workshops and you know lectures and talks. So that's the best way that you can find me and follow my work. Thank you so much, Jason. Uh, behave and be well. Safe travels out here to California, and uh, I'll see you in a couple of months, my friend. Thank you so much. Thank you. Jason Shurka, and we just, uh, I say it uh, so often, uh, we just went bumper to bumper, pole to pole here on Fade to Black, and uh, all of Jason's uh, links are right there at uh, jimmychurchradio.com. They're also throughout our social media, and they're in the video description box below. Tomorrow night on the program, uh, we have got... Uh, the one and only, uh, see, here's the thing tomorrow night. I wanted to do, I wanted to do little UFOs. I wanted to do, uh, some lost history this week. I wanted to do some consciousness and I wanted to do some paranormal. So tomorrow night it's Jim Harold. All right. Tomorrow night, I'm going to figure out what makes that man tick. Fade to black is produced by Hilton J. Palm, Renee, Dennis, and Kevin. Webmaster is Drew the Geek. Music, Doug Aldrich. Intro, Space Boy. Spaceboymusic.com. Fade to Black is produced by KJCR for the Game Changer Network, and this broadcast is owned and copyrighted. 2022 by Fade to Black and the Game Changer Network, Inc. 
It cannot be rebroadcast, downloaded, copied, or used anywhere in the known universe without written permission from Fade to Black and the Game Changer Network. Until tomorrow night with Jim Harold, I want everybody to be safe. Go back, Lee Teppy.